Hey everyone, welcome back to Beach Weekly, a podcast created and produced by Long Beach State student-run newspaper, The Daily 49er. I'm your host, Luke Pajari. Check out our content at daily49er.com, where you can read campus and Long Beach-related news, sports, arts and life, opinions, as well as multimedia content, including more podcasts, videos, and photo galleries. Thanks to Long Beach Transit for sponsoring this episode of Beach Weekly. It might not be quite your turn to get the COVID-19 vaccine, but it is your turn to help a loved one sign up online. Because you're the tech genius of the family, Long Beach Transit has resources to connect you with the vaccine plan. Visit ridelbt.com vaccine for more. This is your one and only podcast source for all things Long Beach State. Let's go ahead and dive right into this week's news roundup. Stay tuned afterwards for this week's Story Spotlight, where Daily 49er Editor-in-Chief Matty Amato talks to an attorney from the ongoing Pavungna lawsuit regarding Long Beach State's plans to build on the native land. Long Beach State softball played a doubleheader against Cal Baptist University on Tuesday, resulting in two losses for the beach. The first game score was 4-5, and the second game ended with a score of 1-2. On Sunday, Long Beach State softball began their conference play with a doubleheader against UC Riverside. The beach was on fire with their first game resulting in a 13-2 win, and their second game ending in a 3-1 win. Long Beach State baseball began their season this weekend with four games against the University of Hawaii. The first game was on Friday, ending in a 2-3 loss for the beach. Saturday's doubleheader resulted in two more losses with a 0-2. Long Beach State Baseball began their season this weekend with four games against the University of Hawaii. The first game was on Friday, ending in a 2-3 loss for the beach. Saturday's doubleheader resulted in two more losses with a 0-1 score for the first game of the day and a 4-6 score in the second. On Sunday, the beach won with a final score of 8-5. Long Beach State's Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship hosted a new program teaching students how to make a profit and contribute to their community. The program, titled Social Justice Entrepreneurship Program, is a four-week entrepreneur workshop that covers the structure of business, economic democracy, the impacts of industrial production, as well as the chance to meet real social justice entrepreneurs. The first session already happened on the 18th, but the next few will be on March 25th, April 8th, and April 15th. For more info, check the Social Justice Entrepreneurship tab under Programs at csulb.edu. The Long Beach City Council unanimously voted Tuesday night on a resolution to condemn xenophobic hate and harassment towards the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hate crimes and acts of racial discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have increased globally and throughout Los Angeles County. According to a Pew Research Center study, About 31% of Asian adults have experienced racial slurs or jokes because of their race or ethnicity since the outbreak began. Long Beach City Council will reconvene on March 23rd at 5 p.m. Last Thursday, via Instagram Live, ASI announced their latest election winners. Jesus Gonzalez will serve as the next ASI president, winning 66.86% of the vote. Lindsay Apaza will serve as the vice president after running unopposed. The lone referendum on the ballot passed, which will add gender-neutral terminology throughout the entire ASI bylaws. The referendum will also update officer position titles, as well as clarify their roles and responsibilities to avoid confusion. Changes will come into effect next semester. For a full list of election winners, go to daily49er.com and find the story under the News tab. Long Beach State's commencement office is considering potential plans to move forward with an in-person graduation ceremony pending approval from the governor's office. The university is anticipating updated guidance from the California Department of Public Health that may allow modified in-person gatherings in a fixed seating outdoor stadium. Dates for an in-person commencement ceremony would be planned for May 28th through the 31st, a week later than the current plan of an on-campus drive through graduation. Updates will be made available on the university's commencement website. According to the California Native American Heritage Commission Sacred Lands Inventory, the sacred site of Pavungna occupies hundreds of acres of Long Beach and Seal Beach, including the 22-acre meadow at Long Beach State. The university's plans for developing on the land has led to an ongoing lawsuit to keep the land protected. 
Here's a conversation between Maddie Amato and an attorney from the lawsuit in which they get into the many details surrounding the case. Take a listen. Let's go back to October 2019 when um, the lawsuit was first filed. Uh, what did that look like? We were contacted by the tribe and the CCA um, in September when they became aware of the um, soil dumping activities on Pavanga. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, immediately um, set to work looking at what we could find in terms of um, approval documents and other information um, that might explain um, the project and any environmental review that was done. Um, we also, before filing suit, and this is in our papers, we did reach out to the university's council to let them know we were intending to file a lawsuit and seek mm -hmm. a um, temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction to stop the dumping until we could get the CEQA suit resolved. Um, and we're told the first time we reached out, no, they weren't interested in, mm -hmm. um, in agreeing to that. Of course, as soon as we filed the lawsuit and the papers asking for the injunction, um, we heard back from the university and they did agree um, to stop dumping at that point and mm -hmm. to not do any further dumping for the duration of the litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, at that point, we didn't have any of the record materials that we have now. Mm -hmm. Really what we had was the, um, the environmental review and approval documents for the um, 2008 master plan mm -hmm. for the campus and then the specific addendum for the Parkside North housing project. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, as we put in our brief, um, we looked through those materials and um, pretty quickly realized that they didn't analyze at all any um, proposed soil dumping on Pavungna. And in fact, they represented that the Parkside North Housing Project would not have any impacts on Pavungna. It was outside of the project area. Um, so, you know, that was that was the initiation of the lawsuit. To clarify, the university filed a response in February of this year, which pretty much they denied all allegations being made against them. What is that response? Ha what impact does that response have on the on the litigation as a whole? Yeah, so that's what's called an answer, mm -hmm. and um, basically that's responding to the petition that we filed back in October 2019. Mm -hmm. So the petition is the document that sort of kicks the litigation off, starts it off, and it lists out all of the allegations, right? Mm -hmm. We say you did this and that and the other thing, and that was a violation of state law. Mm -hmm. The answer... Um, <clears throat> is a response to that basically paragraph by paragraph, allegation mm -hmm. by allegation. And um, it's, um, you know, typically pretty boilerplate. Uh, it's also the place where a respondent will list out any affirmative defenses. Um, affirmative defenses are things like, well, you brought your lawsuit too late or you brought it too early um, or you didn't you know, you didn't have the right to bring it in the first place, things like that. Mm -hmm. But an answer is typically fairly um, standardized mm -hmm. and um, doesn't um, lay out any legal arguments. It's really just a response to the allegations in the petition. So, Winter, what is, I know uh, at least one component of it is seeking a memorandum of understanding with the university. What are the tangible results of this lawsuit if it the judge decides to rule in favor of the tribes so what we're asking for um and maybe i'll take a step back and say a typical remedy in a CEQA suit is that the judge will order the public agency to overturn its decision uh the decision that was undertaken in violation of law here, um, the situation is somewhat unusual because mm -hmm. the university didn't go through a typical CEQA process before deciding to do the dumping. 
So there wasn't a notice sent out to the public. There was no consultation that was done with tribes. There was really no public indication that they had any plans to do this, much less a formal decision that was made. And so usually in a CEQA case, there will be that process. There will be a, a public agency decision saying, hey, here's what we're going to do. And then there will be an opportunity for a challenger to come in and seek court review before the project is undertaken. And so that's why in a typical CEQA suit, the remedy is an order overturning the approval or the permit or whatever the decision was that the public agency did. Here, since there wasn't any formal approval um, or any public process or consultation, the university just did the project. So the, you know, the, um, the dumping has already occurred. So what we're asking the court to do is not only um, declare that the action violated CEQA, but also order the university to put the property back the way it was before they um, violated the law, so remove the soil and um, put the site back the way it was. Um, so that's the, the actual concrete remedy that we are asking for uh, in the litigation. Um, you know, obviously the, the tribe has been through this um, dance with the university before with the litigation in the 1990s over the mini mall. And so what we're really looking for in terms of a permanent resolution here, which would be uh, need to be negotiated with the university, is a more formal binding agreement between the tribe and the university um, that would um, protect the site uh, in the future so that we don't have to, you know, do this um, uh, challenge on repeat uh, in the future. So the MOU is um, basically an agreement um, between the, the tribe, an enforceable agreement between the tribe um, and the university that would govern, um, you know, future development or not, um, consultation with the tribe. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be in the form of an MOU. That's pretty standard between tribes and governmental uh, entities. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, obviously it would be, um, uh, you know, equally acceptable to have something like a conservation easement that would just be a permanent binding limitation on development on the site. So, Winter, what happens if the judge rules in the other direction and rules in favor of the university and, you know, says that there there wasn't, in fact, any violations? What what are what happens and what are the next steps? Yeah, um, if that happens, there's obviously an appeal process that um, my clients would consider. Um, you, as I mentioned, um, we've also uh, requested a formal investigation by the Native American Heritage Commission, which is sort of a separate path. They have um, separate enforcement authority. Um, but the most immediate um, uh, next step would be an appeal. Here's a new tab to open up next to your 8 a.m. Zoom lecture, ridelbt.com slash vaccine. Discover resources you can use to help a not-so-tech-savvy loved one sign up for the COVID-19 vaccine when it's their turn. It's another way Long Beach Transit is moving you through. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Beach Weekly. This is your host, Luke Pajari, signing off. Take care, guys.